Hi, I'm Paco Nathan from O'Reilly Media, and it's a pleasure here today to be with Jean-Francois Puget, who's a distinguished engineer at IBM in uh, machine learning, optimization, and advanced analytics, and also a, a Kaggle Grandmaster, as I understand. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the, the Kaggle competition work that, that you've done? Okay. Kaggle is a legal drug. <laughs> it's very <laughs> addictive. It's, uh, it started uh, as a competition site for machine learning. So basically, you're given some data, a question to answer with machine learning, and people are ranked on the quality of, uh, of their prediction. And it's a great learning experience yes. because uh, the best of the world are there. And it's very addictive. So go there, but be careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I noticed also looking at GitHub, I, I saw some of your repos there. You're making a lot of use out of open source. Oh, yeah. For so for, for machine learning and deep learning, open source has one, I would say. Uh, you still have some good proprietary software, uh, like SPSS, but you can find all state-of-the-art algorithms in our, our Python, basically. So this has changed the game. Uh, when I started my career, the problem was to be able to train a model, to create a model. Now, training a model is easy. It may take resource, but you write a few lines of code and you can train good models. So as a, as a vendor in that industry, we looked at, given open source community has solved the problem of creating models, what are the other pain points people have if they want to build a machine learning or an AI application? And that's what we are looking. We are looking at pain points and trying to address them by providing tools that complement open source. Excellent. Uh, what, uh, what kind of tooling then? So we started um, like two or three years ago. Nobody was speaking about deploying models. Some were doing it, of course, but so we focus for the last two years on, well, I've met too many times prospects telling me, okay, I've hired data scientists. It's been two years now producing models, but how do I move my Spark ML model into my payment system? How do I move my scikit-learn model into something else? So, and the, the current, the, the approach at that time was to have developers recode in Java or right. COBOL or C++, <laughs> something that people developed in R or Python. So we said, no, you cannot recode. It takes months and you do it only once. So we worked on a way to take a model, serialize it, and then read it in a runtime that can be, uh, that uh, is exposed as a REST API. So we have a one-click uh, story where you can take a model and in one click you create a web service, a REST service that serves your model. So now other people are doing it, but we were really the first and that's our first tooling. So we have a good story and deployment. Now we are looking at, that's also something people, especially coming from data mining statistics, they may not realize. Machine learning is a continuous process. You don't create a model once and you're done. If you build a, a, a fraud detection model, you need to update it regularly because criminals find new ways, try new ways. Um, so you need to be able to manage versioning, to deploy models, but also to detect when your model is no longer effective. So we also, when, you cr when we cr deploy a model, we also deploy a way to capture feedback. Now, is that detection of the model degradation that's happening in situ as the model is deployed, or does somebody have to pull it back and it do it? It can analysis? be done in batch or, so it can be in situ if we take e-commerce recommender system, which is, uh, uh, people may not know, but it's probably the most uh, useful from a business point of view, use of machine learning. You know, when you put things in your basket and the site tells you, oh, there are people also buy this, these recommendations are machine learning predictions. So here you can have feedback because you rec the system, your model recommends which product a visitor might want to buy. But when the visitor actually pays for 
the basket, you know exactly what the visitor wanted to buy. So by comparing what people buy versus what was recommended to them, you can, uh, you can see how, how far your predictions are from the reality. And that's the feedback I'm, I'm uh, discussing. So in this case, you can get almost real-time feedback. So if you get this feedback to your training system, you could train your model almost real time or every day or every hour, I don't know, but you can retrain it. In other case, the feedback can take a long time. In fraud detection, credit card transaction fraud detection, gotcha. you can have a suspicion of a fraud, but the confirmation that it is a fraud, you know, your, the cardholder must file a complaint, you must investigate, so it may take two months. Yeah. So the f when the feedback takes two months, then it's a batch process. So, but the point is, you should always monitor how your predictions compare to reality because there can be a drift and if you don't monitor, you don't know. This is interesting because for so long we were taught in computer science to make the absolute best code, the most efficient code, uh, the most elegant code so somebody else could work on it. But now the code is becoming less relevant. It's more about the predictions. Really, Yeah, so that's also something I like to say. You know, people, you can read in uh, social media and newspapers, oh, AI will remove this work and this work, blah, blah, blah. But I think a category that is at risk is software developer. Yes, I agree. Because if we look at machine learning, it's basically replacing human uh, code by trained models. So I'm not saying all software development will disappear, but part of it would be replaced by machine learning. Uh, I'm curious, are there active learning kinds of cases, human in the loop use cases that you're looking at? So that's uh, a good segue, uh, segue to another bottleneck. So I, deployment was a, a serious bottleneck. The other bottleneck that people starting the machine learning or AI journey don't realize, machines do not learn from raw data. They learn from label data from input-output pairs. We, it's called supervised learning. People speak about unsupervised learning, blah, blah, but in reality, what works in business today, it's supervised learning. You tell the machine what it has to learn. You give it examples of what it has to do. Uh, as I say, when you know what to learn is difficult, but when you don't know, it's very, right. very difficult. It's like, going at school and being, being taught mathematics or discovering new theorems. It's the former is easier, even if a lot of people find learning mathematics difficult, discovering mathematics is <laughs> way harder. So we need label data. And here is an example. I was, um, I was involved in, with a bank. They wanted to build a fraud detection, credit card fraud detection model and they have tried for two years. And they tried with a lot of vendors, technologies, could not find something that would work. So, and uh, we, they, they tried with us. And I said, do we have data? Sure, sure, we have a data set of millions of transactions. Okay. Do we know, do we have labels? Do we know which transactions are fraud? Yes, yes, okay. Can I have the data? Oh, no, it's a bank. You. So I did what I had to do. After a month or two, I got the data. I looked, all right, three million transactions. But where is the label? Ah, oh, it's in this other file. I look at the other file. File. 1,700 rows, eight fraud. We cannot learn from eight examples, not with today's technology at least. So maybe a human can, but not the machine. So. I say, can't you assign someone to spend a couple of weeks labeling more transactions? We need 10, 100 times more uh, examples. No, nope. I say, well, good luck. And the guy was fired six months later because he could not build a model. And all it took, all, all it, it was missing was two week, two man week. And that's something don't get. I even had, so you know, Watson is uh, the brand we use for public cloud 
offerings from IBM in, uh, in the machine learning and AI space. So, so I was also involved in some uh, pre-sale activity for selling some of these service. And same, we need to train them. So, uh, and the prospect was saying, can't Watson compute the label for us before training? And I tried to explain, well, if we do a good job, then Watson will be able to compute the, the label. That's what learning is about. But <laughs> without the labels, you really don't have data. We need examples. Yeah. And then it will compute labels automatically, but we cannot reverse. So, uh, and to be honest, today we have not done much. So we have research, r researchers, and it's an active uh, uh, area to build system that requires less examples. And uh, you mentioned active learning, that's exactly what it is. So instead of labeling millions of rows, you start with a subset, train a model, and then the model predicts on the rest, and where the prediction, let's say it's a binary classification, so when it is zero, it knows, when it is one, it knows, but for some example, the model will not know, predict it's half, a half probability. Then if you label those examples, you help the model a lot. So active learning is, the idea is to look at examples where the model is not confident and ask for labels. And this way, the company is adding value to their data. Exactly. So we are working on, uh, on tooling to help people label data because it is the next bottleneck we're seeing. Excellent. Well, I, I wanted to follow up about one other point. Uh, we, we talk about supervised learning, and, and deep learning, of course, is very popular for this now. But it, it strikes me, coming from some of, uh, I think we have some shared background in this, AI is a much broader context, uh, especially if we go back a few years. Yeah. So. I'm old enough <laughs> to have uh, witnessed some AI winter in the past. So AI goes by high period where people made bold promise, you know, yeah. and then the promise are not met. Then nobody wants to speak about AI anymore and it goes up. And at each cycle, the scope of AI changes. So when AI started, people don't realize. So in a lot of history collection, AI is starts with a, a US researcher called John McCarthy in a conference in 1956 in Dartmouth College, 1956. But an Englishman called Alan Turing published in 1956 years uh, before a paper where he introduced what is known as a Turing test. So he defined AI as so with today's words, let's say you have two chat windows on your smartphone or laptop. So you have two conversations, but one of the conversation is with a human, the other with a machine, and you don't know. And you converse, and your goal is to find which is a machine. And Turing says, if you cannot find which one is a machine, then the machine is intelligent. That's his definition. And if you think about it, it means the machine must be able to understand natural language, of course, but also to understand jokes, uh, to understand sentiment, to reason, because you can ask the machine to solve problems. You can ask general knowledge questions. You can. So this opens a, a whole lot of possibilities. And to really fool a human, the machine must really be close to human capabilities. And this way of defining AI is very broad. You have natural language, you have learning, you have uh, reasoning, planning, a lot of things. And for decades, AI research was learning, natural language, uh, planning, a lot of things. But in the last five years, something strange happened. Very old algorithms called backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent became hype because they were used in something called deep learning. And uh, five years ago, in 2013, uh, a team of researchers showed that these models were able to recognize what's in pictures as well as humans and much better than whatever existed before. This was the start of the buzz around deep learning. So today, 
maybe 90% of the academics and researchers in AI work on deep learning. So today, we can more or less say AI equals deep learning. But that was not true five years ago, and I don't think it would be true five years from now, uh, because reasoning, planning, uh, natural language processing is important too. It's not just, and if we think about it, now we call AI the ability to recognize what's in a picture or to recognize the meaning of a sentence, basically. That's the two main use cases for deep learning. Well, any children of age five can do it, or six. So now we are ecstatic because we have computers able to do what an average ch child can do. It is AI. I remember when I was younger, we were discussing expert system, trying to mimic the top performance of human in reasoning. Now we just want to mimic what uh, children can do. Well, in your keynote this morning, there's a brilliant example of where managers were rejecting the automation until they could actually see the simulation side by side where the AI was optimizing pricing consistently better than any yeah. of the managers could do. And until people really feel the pain, they, they don't understand what the competition is there. And this brings something else, because you say, I, I did say AI, but the technology used there was machine learning and something called mathematical optimization. Before it was used, it was called operations research. And for some reason, I was not born, uh, probably in the early days, people doing operations research and people doing AI hated each other. Right. And this divide is, uh, is still alive today to some form. So for many AI researchers, mathematical optimization is not part of AI. I think it's, if we unzoom and again look at AI, the ability to perform complex tasks, mathematical optimization is, is really part of AI. And that's really what I believe. And I believe every data scientist should know about optimization, not just about machine learning and deep learning. It's, it speaks to the strength of what we can do with a lot yes. of, of automation. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Jean-Francois. Pleasure. It was a good conversation. Wonderful.